In this video, we're going to discuss calorimetry. So in the last few videos, we've established uh, heat as an important aspect of energy transfer for thermodynamic systems and in thermochemistry. We established enthalpy as a type of heat that's transferred at constant pressure. Right, and calorimetry is really just the science of, of measuring heat. Right, so calorimetry is the science of measuring heat. Right, so calorimetry deals with how experimentally we're able to classify and, and quantify uh, heat transfer from thermodynamic systems, especially chemical reactions in our case. Right, so, um, so it depends on the types of conditions uh, that the experiment is done under, what type of heat or energy transfer you'll actually be measuring. Uh, so you can measure heat transfer at constant pressure, right? Think about a situation where we're at constant pressure, either you're at atmospheric pressure or some sort of controlled pressure environment, right? So that means the heat is going to be transferred at constant pressure. I'll use Q sub P for heat at constant pressure. Well, we just saw that this is equal to the enthalpy change, right? So if you're measuring the heat transferred at constant pressure, you're measuring the enthalpy change, right? You can also look at this uh, scenario at constant volume. So I'll use Q sub V for that, uh, for that heat transfer. Under that scenario, you're actually going to be measuring the change in internal energy, right? So for constant volume calorimetry, you're going to be looking at the change in internal energy for your system. At constant pressure, you're getting the enthalpy change. Now, regardless of whether you're doing constant pressure or constant volume calorimetry, uh, there's going to be three factors that are going to determine how much heat is released from your system, how you can measure how much heat is gained or lost by your system. So there are three factors that determine heat transfer. Okay, so the first one is going to be the net temperature change, right? So you're going to look at some process, whether it's a gas expansion or chemical reaction or whatnot, and how much heat is transferred from your system is going to affect the net temperature change, right? So first we're going to want to look at the net temperature change. The second factor is going to be um, the amount of your substance, right? So the amount of your substance, right? So whether it's something that you're dissolving in water or a chemical reaction occurring or a gas expansion, if you have more of that substance, there's going to be a more dramatic temperature shift, right? Whatever its effect is, is going to be magnified if you have more of the substance, it is going to be nullified if you have less of that substance. And the third one, and really important here, is going to be the heat capacity of the substance. And we'll talk more about heat capacity in just a second, but it is the last main key factor that's going to affect the, uh, the amount of heat that's transferred in your system. So the heat capacity, and I'm going to use a capital C, to denote heat capacity in any equation. So I'll put that there. The heat capacity is C. Uh, so the heat capacity of the substance. Right, so heat capacity actually determines how much heat is absorbed uh, per degree of temperature change, right? So that's actually the definition of the heat capacity. Heat capacity is going to be equal to the heat absorbed over the increase in temperature. Right, so heat capacity is often defined as the amount of heat necessary to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree, right? The amount of heat absorbed per degree of temperature, right? So usually the units for this will look something like the following. It'll be like joules per degree C or joules per Kelvin. 
right? Something like that. Some energy, a ratio of energy and temperature based on this definition, right? So those are the three factors that control uh, or determine heat transfer in a system. The net temperature change that occurs, the amount of, sip of the substance that you actually have, and the heat capacity of that substance. Now, there are actually three um, different ways that we can express the heat capacity. So there are three ways. to express heat capacity. Right, and I wanna go through each one. They'll all have different units and ways to solve for them, right? Um, so, and oh, let me write this down as an equation as well. So let me write this. So if we got heat absorbed over increase in temperature, so that's Q over delta T, right? So the heat capacity is equal to Q, our heat transferred, over the change in temperature delta T. So C is equal to Q delta T. So, uh, so the three ways that the heat capacity can be expressed, right, the units here, the first one is just what I've just called the regular heat capacity. So it's heat capacity. And I'll use C to denote the just regular heat capacity. And this is the one where you'll have units of joules per degree cel uh, Celsius, right? So if we wanted to solve for the heat, given this definition of heat capacity, right? You'll got, you got C is equal to Q over delta T. If we do the algebra and isolate the heat, you can solve for the heat transfer by saying Q is equal to C times delta T, right? The heat capacity times the change in temperature. Okay, so the second way that you can express the heat capacity is something called the specific heat. So specific heat, I'm going to denote that one as C sub M for specific heat. And so for this one, its units include the mass of your substance. So the units for uh, specific heat are gonna be something like joules per degree C per gram, right? So it actually includes the mass of your substance, right? And so if you wanted to solve for the heat change in the case of the specific heat, if you're given a specific heat value, then you want to have the specific heat times the mass of your substance times the temperature change. Right, because at the end of the day, you want an energy transfer, some sort of unit of energy for your heat, right? In the case of the heat capacity, it's simple, right? You're gonna have the heat capacity as joules per, you know, Kelvin or something, joules per degree C. You get your temperature change, those temperature units cancel out, you're just left with joules. In the case of the specific heat, you'll have that temperature change and you'll also have the mass of your substance and then you'll multiply the specific heat in order to get just joules left as your unit, right? Okay, the third one is called the molar heat capacity. So we got molar heat capacity. And so this one includes the number of moles uh, in the definition of the heat capacity. So you got joules per degree C per mole. Uh, oh, and I'm going to use C sub N to denote the molar heat capacity. And so if you want to solve for the heat transfer in this case, then you'll need to multiply the molar heat capacity by the number of moles of your substance times the change in temperature, right? So three different ways to express the heat capacity, three different ways to calculate the heat, but they're all related to the exact same definition of the heat capacity, right? As the amount of heat necessary to increase your, uh, the temperature of your substance by one degree. Okay, so let's go through an example problem here. So this problem says that the enthalpy change per mole of sodium hydroxide is four, negative 43 kilojoules per mole when you have the following process, right? So this is just sodium hydroxide, you're dropping solid sodium hydroxide into water to make an aqueous solution, right? Oh, wait, let me go back. I, I didn't go through um, the, how you do this experimentally. So 
Uh, so we'll go back to the problem in just a second. I did include this figure here. Um, this is an example of a constant pressure calorimeter. This is what's known as a coffee cup calorimeter. And hope, usually this is a very general experiment that's done in most general chemistry classes um, as an approximation to a constant pressure calorimeter. Uh, basically, it's that constant pressure because you're, you'll usually be doing this on a desktop or bench top uh, at atmospheric pressure. And basically what you do is you, you add your reaction mixture into a water bath, right? So you'll have some sort of water bath and you'll do your reaction in aqueous solution. You have a, basically a double cup setup where you have these insulated styrofoam cups, two of them so that you have very little heat being transferred, right? Um, so you're trying to, to make sure that all of the heat that's transferred from your reaction is just in the water bath and isn't being lost to the atmosphere. You have an insulated stopper and you basically put a stir in there to stir your reaction and a thermometer to, uh, to measure the net change in the temperature, right? So basically what you would do is do your reaction in this calorimeter. You would measure the temperature change and based on the heat capacity, you would know how much heat is, is transferred to the surroundings, transferred to your water bath uh, by measuring the temperature change in your constant pressure coffee cup calorimeter, right? So this is an example of a, a constant pressure calorimeter. An example of a constant volume calorimeter is something called a bomb calorimeter. I won't go through in detail what it is. Uh, you can look it up if you're interested, or I think there's a little bit about it in your book, but a bomb calorimeter would be an example of a constant volume calorimeter. Okay, now let's move on to the, to the question at hand. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so you have an enthalpy change per mole for sodium hydroxide being dissolved in aqueous solution. The question is asking you if 10 grams of solid sodium hydroxide is added to one liter of water at 25 degrees C in a constant pressure calorimeter, right? So just like our coffee cup calorimeter, a constant pressure calorimeter, what will be the final temperature of the solution? And it gives you that the density of water is one gram per milliliter and the specific heat of water is 4.184 uh, joules per degree C per gram, right? Okay, so a lot here, a lot here. But what we need to do is just kind of break this down into segments, right? We know that eventually we want to be able to use this equation that we have, right? So since we're dealing with the specific heat, we have our specific heat times the mass times delta T, right? We're being asked to solve for the final volume. That final volume is, is in this delta T term, right? T at, uh, the, the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Right, but the only thing, so we already have the specific heat, uh, we have the mass. What we need to figure out is how much heat is transferred in this process, right? We have an amount of our solid, 10 grams of solid sodium hydroxide. We want to figure out how much heat is transferred in that process, and then we'll be able to, to answer what's the final temperature going to be. We know how much heat is released for one mole of sodium hydroxide, so we can use that to figure out how much heat is released for 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. So let's do that first. So we have 10 grams of sodium hydroxide, right? So the molar mass of sodium hydroxide is 40. So if we use that molar mass, right, we'll have 40 grams of sodium hydroxide in one mole of sodium hydroxide, right? So that gives us that we have about a quarter of a mole. So we got 0.25 moles of sodium hydroxide. Now we can use this enthalpy that we were given per mole to figure out how much heat is released from this 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. So we know that this 10 grams is 0.25 moles of sodium hydroxide. And from the problem, we learned that negative 43 kilojoules of heat is released per mole of sodium hydroxide. So doing the math here, we get negative uh, 10.75 kilojoules of heat that will be released for 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. Okay, so anticipating that our specific heat was given to us in joules, per degree C per gram. I'm gonna go ahead and convert this guy from kilojoules 
to joules, that's just multiplying by a thousand. So we release um, negative 10,750 joules of energy uh, for 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. Okay, so now we have Q. This is Q, right? This is the amount of heat that's released in, the pro in, the, uh, in this process, right, of just um, dissolving sodium hydroxide. So now uh, we can plug this in, right? So we, we can use this equation, right, and solve for our final temperature, right? So let's, let's do that. So first, we want to isolate delta T here because we know we want to, to solve for the final temperature. So algebraically moving some stuff around, we got delta T is going to be equal to Q. Make that tail so dramatic. Q over the specific heat times the mass, right? Now, our delta T can be expanded as TF minus TI, where TF is our final temperature. TI is our initial temperature, right? That's going to be equal to Q over CM times the mass, right? And so we're trying to solve for our final temperature. So we want to isolate TF. So TF is just going to be equal to Q over CM times M plus the initial temperature, right? So that would give us our final temperature. Now, the only thing that's left here, right? Uh, whenever you're doing these problems of calorimetry, right, you're solving for, you're taking the measurement of the temperature in the water, right? So you, when we're talking about this mass here, we're not talking about the 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. We're talking about the mass of the water, right? Because that's where the measurement is made. So we have one liter of water. We need to know how much that is as far as a mass. So we need to figure out the mass of water. And we can do that since we were given the density, right? So we have one liter. So that's going to be a thousand milliliters of water. The density is one gram for every one milliliter. So that means if we have a thousand milliliters of water, that means we have a thousand grams of water. So that's going to be equal to a thousand grams of water. Right, so that's gonna be the mass that we're gonna to wanna to use here, right? So we can plug that guy in, and now we have everything we need to plug in and solve for our final temperature, right? So we know that the heat released was negative 10,750 joules. We know that our specific heat is 4.184, that's joules per degree C uh, per gram. Right, times the mass, which is a thousand grams of water, plus our initial temperature, which is 25 degrees C. Right, so um, let's make sure that our units check out here. So the joules cancel out. Joules cancel out here, perfect. Grams cancel out there, perfect. So you should be left with Celsius on both sides and therefore we should get a final temperature. And by Celsius for both of these terms that you're adding together, right? So TF is just going to be 2.57 degrees Celsius plus 25 degrees Celsius. And that gives us a final temperature of 27.57 degrees Celsius. Right, so just from knowing this initial information, we're able to get the uh, figure out what the final temperature is going to be when we dissolve a certain amount of sodium hydroxide into a uh, aqueous solution.